Coming up on Network Africa. Protest in Sudan as citizens demand reforms from the transitional government. Ethiopia, Sudan and Egypt commended for their continued negotiations on the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Plus, swarms of locusts continue to devastate parts of northern Kenya. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Layo Adegoke. We begin in Sudan where Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok is calling for calm as demonstrators embark on a million strong march to demand the implementation of the goals of the revolution that ousted long serving leader Omar al Bashir last year. Activists are calling for the formation of a transitional parliament, the appointment of civilian regional governors, and a reform of the country's security agencies. The protests are also taking place in the midst of soaring food prices and fuel shortages and the coronavirus pandemic. Authorities barricaded the main roads in the capital Khartoum and deployed heavily towards the army headquarters, according to local media. Well, let's get the latest from Naba Mohidin, VOA's journalist in Khartoum. Tell us, Naba, how big is this protest and what's the latest so far? The protest is so big, but it's not central, like every neighborhood and every block has its own protest because uh, the abandoned procedures and the health enforcement. Uh, the latest is the riot police and the security forces attack the protesters near the parliament uh, buildings with tear gas. Um, uh, there is some weapons, uh, but uh, there is no casualty there of former President Omar al-Bashir are also protesting. It's like a rival demonstration. What are they hoping to achieve with this? Actually, they were planning for this uh, for a long time through their uh, formal media. They want to um, take down the government or the student government and they want a partnership with the military. They want the military to end the transitional government uh, and period and to make a coup, a military coup, um, in a cooperation with Islamists in different streams. So uh, they were organizing protests uh, in order to um, end the transitional government and to uh, make the uh, and the people by their side um, condemn the high prices and high, uh, food prices and also the, some sort that the new government is trying to, to publish in the education and the new chain that, again, the uh, Islamic thought that we used to 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 have it or to live with it for uh, almost 50 years. So they were revoking people and telling them that uh, it's not uh, good and it's not a uh, and it's not Islamic thought. And in order to make um, polarization and to make people by their by their side and to make them little to end the transitional government and to end the transitional period and make them cool, and it's going to again. All right, VOA's journalist in Khartoum, Naba Mohidin, thank you for bringing us up to date. Well, to neighboring South Sudan, where President Salva Kiir has appointed governors for eight of the country's 10 regional states after sharing them out with his former rival and now the country's vice president, Rik Mashar. The president also appointed superintendents for three administrative areas. Two weeks ago, the two leaders ended a stalemate over control of the state, which had been a sticking point for the transitional unity government formed in February. President Keir's camp was allocated six states, which include the capital, Juba, while Mr. Mashar's camp was allocated three states that include the major oil-producing Upper Nile state. 
Under Secretary General for Political and Peace Building Affairs, Rosemary DiCarlo, has commended Ethiopia, Sudan and Egypt for their continuing negotiations on the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Addressing the Security Council, DiCarlo expressed hope that the three countries will reach a mutually beneficial agreement on the dam since December 2013. 10, construction of the dam started and there have since been several rounds of talks among the parties. I commend the parties for their determination to negotiate an agreement and applaud the African Union's effort to facilitate a process to this end. The remaining differences are technical and legal in nature. They include the binding nature of an agreement, the dispute resolution mechanism, and the management of water flow through droughts. While we recognize the importance of this project to the developmental objectives of the Ethiopian people, a goal that we certainly share and support, it is essential to realize that this mega dam, which is Africa's largest hydropower facility, potentially threatens the welfare, the well being, and the existence of millions of Egyptians and Sudanese citizens. Therefore, the unilateral filling and operation of this dam without an agreement that includes the necessary precautions to protect the downstream communities and to prevent the infliction of significant harm on their riparian rights would heighten tension and could provoke crises and conflicts that further destabilize an already troubled region. Ethiopia must ensure that any potential negative impact uh, of the project is properly addressed and adequately um, uh, mitigated in close consultation and cooperation with the downstream countries. But Ethiopia doesn't believe the issue being discussed today has a legitimate place in the Security Council. It is bound to set a bad precedent and open a Pandora box. This council should not be a forum for exerting diplomatic pressure. As we have informed the council, the tripartite negotiation between Ethiopia, Egypt, and the Sudan has not yet been concluded. The three countries have in fact reached consensus on most of the prominent technical issues in the last rounds of the negotiation. That's why Ethiopia is of the few that progress at hand and a mutually beneficial agreement is within reach. Turkana, a northwest Kenyan region, is under a low-cost attack. A new generation of these pests have hatched and are eating everything in sight and destroying vast farmlands. There are increasing fears for food security in East Africa. Earlier in the year, billions of the insects destroyed crops across the region, and the UN is warning of a second generation that could be even more destructive. The branches on trees around Kenya's northern town of Lodwar have been stripped bare of leaves, bending downwards under the weight of voracious young locust. The new generation has hatched in Turkana, Kenya's poorest region. The young locusts are eating everything in sight, and when their wings mature, the swarms will be able to travel up to 130 kilometers, or 80 miles, in a day. The hatchings have occurred as crops are planted in a region where 20 million people struggle for food. Turkana has been a county with a lot of food insecurity. So FAO has been supporting the national government and the county government to address that. Uh, but now the locusts have worsened the situation because as we are trying to talk about food security, trying to make sure that the, the livestock have enough feed, people have, have adequate crops, the locusts have come to destabilize an already bad situation. Kirira fears the swarms will spread quickly and said teams are working frantically to spray them with insecticide before they become airborne. Actually now in the mature stage and within one week they may mature to swarms that may fly away. So our prayer is that we try to arrest that because they can go and cause problems in other, country, other countries and other regions. So our wish is to, to control them before they leave Trukana County. Residents are beating tin drums to scare away the insects. They destroy our maize, purple tree, so it gives us a hard work, hard time. 
So we, we have to, they, because they don't want more noise, we use noise to get rid of them. Numbers of locusts exploded in East Africa and the Red Sea region in late 2019, exacerbated by atypical weather patterns amplified by climate change. Swarms of insects flew west from Yemen and this year reached Kenya, Somalia and Ethiopia. We begin our coronavirus coverage in Senegal, where the country is lifting its state of emergency and nighttime curfew imposed to curb the spread of the virus. In a televised address, President Macky Sall announced the resumption of international flights from the 15th of July, but under stringent safety measures. Mr. Saul warned that the country's economic growth would slow from 6.8% to 1.1% or even less due to the impact of the pandemic. Civil servants will now work from 8 to 5 p.m. local time, but entertainment spots are to remain closed. Wearing of face masks remain mandatory in public spaces, workplaces, public transport and shops. Air Côte d'Ivoire has resumed domestic flights after a three-month shutdown and a 24 million U.S. dollar cash injection from the government to keep it afloat. Although international flights could resume on July the 1st, the CEO says the coronavirus has slowed down the airline's plans to get into the long-haul business. Air Côte d'Ivoire is confident it will soon recoup its losses quickly now that internal flights resumed from Friday, June the 26th, thanks to a government injection of 24 million US dollars to keep it afloat. International flights are expected to begin on July the 1st. Passengers doing business in Ivory Coast said they are relieved the airline had resumed operations. I am about to board the Air Côte d'Ivoire flight from Corogo, and I am really pleased that the flights have resumed because we, our company and our country need it. Really, this resumption helps a lot, helps us move around easily and travel within the country and come back. So I am really happy. Without state help, the airline that operates in one of West Africa's busiest hubs would not have recovered after grounding its planes for nearly three months because of the coronavirus pandemic. We had grounded planes with no revenue, but we still had fixed charges, like the hiring of planes, which we had to keep paying for. We had to continue paying the personnel. We had to pay in order to prepare for the relaunch, and all those are fixed costs that we had to honor if we wanted to take off after this period. So we contacted the state. We calculated all our fixed costs for the three-month period which had been foreseen until the end of the month of June, and the state was favorable and supported us. Boarding and preparations are more complicated than before the virus. Passengers have to keep a safe distance at the check-in desk, get their temperatures checked before boarding, and buses to the planes have a limit. Air Côte d'Ivoire CEO René Docry mentioned that because the air is filtered every three minutes, passengers don't need to keep a two-meter distance between each seat. He mentioned this on Friday when passengers boarded the first plane to take off from Abidjan's airport in three months. We think that here, if we can start in July, we will maybe get, if all goes well, around 80% of the passengers we need by the end of the year. And that is optimistic. Air Côte d'Ivoire carried more than 750,000 passengers last year. Still to come on the program. As the Democratic Republic of Congo marks 60 years of independence, Belgian King Felipe expresses deep regrets over colonial abuses. You join us again. Welcome back to the program. Locally produced face masks are providing a cheaper supply for the high demand in Somalia. Like many businesses around the world, Yoko factory based in Mogadishu had to adapt when the coronavirus pandemic hit the country. 
launched in October 2019. It used to make environmentally friendly bags, but now the owners have transformed the factory and now make 50,000 face marks a day. At a factory in Mogadishu, hundreds of workers are making 50,000 face masks a day. We started this factory a year ago and we used to work on environmental products, making woven bags to save the environment. Our intention to stop the use of plastic bags in the country. With the outbreak of coronavirus, we've stopped making use of those bags and started making face masks to take part in the fight against coronavirus in Somalia. The World Health Organization says the use of face masks can limit the spread of the coronavirus. Before Hashi and Yoko joined the fray, the masks available were mostly Chinese made and were sold for as much as $10 each. Somalia, which has one of the world's weakest health systems, has limited options to cope with the 2,894 cases it currently has. When we heard of the disease, people got really scared and we couldn't afford to buy face masks because they were very expensive for us. We asked if donors could double the distribution of masks and essential services to us. In the Herdogul camp for displaced people on the outskirts of Mogadishu, even 40 cents is beyond the reach of many of the families who live here. So volunteers from Yoko are handing out their masks for free. We are making the face masks as humanitarians, not for business. Our people are facing this epidemic and disease. We are making masks that will help prevent its spread among our people. We sell one mask for 40 cents to cover the running and packaging cost. A package of 50 pieces sells for 20 US dollars. And workers have said the virus could spread undetected in the camps, where maintaining a safe distance and regular hand washing are a challenge with particular concern for the capital Mogadishu, host to some 800,000 displaced people seeking refuge from floods and conflict. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, some Tunisians are struggling with water shortage. The lack of access to clean running water in some Tunisian states poses a threat to residents when personal hygiene and regular sanitization are imperative to help prevent infection and the spread of coronavirus. Naya Yakubi says she struggles to get water as she walks miles every day up to a mountain well near her village in Tunisia to fill dozens of plastic jerry cans with water she knows isn't clean or safe for drinking. Difficult to reach, the well is located just below Jebel Troza, a famous mountain east of Kairouan, Tunisia, pouring out water that residents have for more than two years been saying is contaminated. We struggle to get water. I am sick. My knees and hands hurt after I come back. People help me put the plastic bottles on the donkey to take home. But the water jerry cans are not enough. I give some of the water to my donkeys, some to my sheep, and I use the rest for laundry or cleaning. So before you know it, the bottles are empty. Every day is like this. I have to fill the bottles up to two or three times. During the coronavirus pandemic, her plight seemed even more challenging. 200,000 Tunisian families today don't have access to water. Not just drinking water, but any kind of water. So sometimes they have to move several miles away just to get water they need. More than half of their income sometimes goes to water. Nearly five years ago, every Tunisian could access up to 440 cubic meters of water annually. Today, it is down to 389 cubic meters per capita, says Swilmi, warning that climate change and population growth might cause the amount to drop to 300 cubic meters per capita by 2050. Despite these fears, Tunisia last month recorded zero new coronavirus cases for the first time since early March due to serious lockdown measures. Complaints of water shortage and water cuts in Tunisia have been rising for years, with the first water cuts having taken place in the summer of 2013 in the greater Tunis area. The country has recorded 1,048 cases of COVID-19, 
and 48 deaths. Demonstrations have broken out in Ethiopia following the shooting dead of musician Hachalu Hundessa, well known for his political songs. Local media reports that two people have also died during the protests in one town. Hachalu's songs often focused on the rights of the country's Oromo ethnic group and became anthems in a wave of protests that led to the downfall of the previous prime minister. The 34-year-old had said that he had received death threats. While well, Belgium's King Felipe has expressed what he describes as his deepest regrets to the Democratic Republic of Congo for his country's colonial abuses, the reigning monarch made the comments in a letter to President, President Felix Shisekedi on the 60th anniversary of DR Congo's independence. This is the first time a Belgian monarch has formally expressed remorse for what happened during the country's colonial rule. In a letter sent to President Shisekedi and published in Belgian media, King Felipe praises the privileged partnership between the two nations now. But he says there have been painful episodes in their history, including during the reign of King Leopold II, who he does not directly name, and in the 20th century. Belgium controlled the Central African country from the 19th century until it won its independence in 1960. Millions of Africans died during Belgium's bloody colonial rule. Well, while Belgians confront their colonial past in the wake of global protests over the death of George Floyd in police custody, a neighborhood in Brussels seen by some as a haven for black citizens is gearing up for a big celebration. The Matong Quarter, named after a district in the Democratic Republic of Congo, on Tuesday marks 60 years since the DRC gained independence from Belgian colonial rule. Music artist Gabs, whose real name is Gabriel Fodery, grew up in Matongi and knows most of the shop owners in the area, from hairdressers to designers and restaurant owners. <laughs> Looking at a big canvas painted by Congolese artist Sherry Samba about the Matongi area hanging on a building of a busy shopping street, Fodery says it represents the quarter very well. For me, this painting represents Matonge well, because Matonge is not only seen from the eye of a young Congolese from Brussels, Matonge is a neighborhood that belongs to everyone. According to him, the absolute cultural mix is what makes Matonge special. What makes Matonge special, you can walk down the street and find people of all origins, of all nationalities, of all kinds. There is no limit here in Matange. Everything is possible. You can meet absolutely anyone. In Matonge, known for its hairdressers selling hair extensions, wigs and African cuisine, the focus has been more on reopening after the coronavirus lockdown than on protesting racism despite widespread Black Lives Matter protests in the Belgian capital. Personally, I say that racism exists also in Belgium. You can find it everywhere, not just in Belgium. But I don't really think in Brussels, maybe outside of Brussels, in Flanders. But here in Brussels, I don't see racism. Or maybe the racists are hypocrites. Just don't feel it as much as elsewhere. Tucked away between the luxury stores of Brussels, Upskill Avenue, Louise, and the European Union institutions, Matonge long suffered from a reputation for crime, including drug dealing. Fodery said the area could heat up a bit sometimes, but insists that people from the neighborhood were not part of the clashes after a Black Lives Matter protest in early June. And that's where we end Network Africa today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Adegoke.